feels like the end of the story, doesn't it? Jesus is dead, his body taken down from the cross, wrapped in a linen cloth, brought to a tomb, hewn out of rock and sealed with a stone against the door. His mother and one of his best friends watched the whole thing. They must have been exhausted. They must have been exhausted both from the events of the week and also from the sheer weight of the trauma and the grief of seeing their beloved Jesus arrested and tortured and executed in one of the crueler ways that human beings have designed to kill other human beings. We know that grief, even, even grief after a natural death is exhausting enough. It's hard to imagine what the folks who loved Jesus and followed him were going through. And what's more, it was such a rapid turnaround for Jesus. We remembered just this morning, right at the beginning of the service, how he rode into Jerusalem on a colt with his followers, had put the cloaks on the colt, and then they laid cloaks in the road so that the colt wouldn't have to step in the dirt and the dust. And when there weren't enough cloaks, the people cut branches from the trees and they laid them down in the road and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It was joyous. We're so accustomed to this because we hear it every year. It's easy for us to miss the significance of what they were shouting as they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem with those shouts of Hosanna shouting, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. They made it clear what they thought was happening. They thought that Jesus was there to take over the government. They thought that he was going to lead them in revolution, in overthrowing the Roman oppressors and their Judean lackeys who aligned themselves with the occupiers in order to make their own lives easier. Those people who shouted Hosanna and who lay the cloaks and the leafy branches on the path, they were looking to Jesus to reestablish the Davidic monarchy. That ancient time that we read about in the Hebrew Bible when David was the king. They attributed David's ancestry to Jesus and wanted him to save them. That's what Hosanna means. Hosanna means something along the lines of save us. It seems like they hadn't actually paid any attention to what Jesus said and did during his ministry. If they had, they would have realized that he wasn't going to simply recreate the governmental structure that existed, but with the Judeans at the top instead of the Romans. He wasn't setting himself up to be the ruling king over the Jewish people in the way that they wanted, that they expected. That was never part of Jesus's plan. And when they thought it was, it was just their own desires and projections that they were putting on Jesus, which is entirely natural, entirely natural. When people are oppressed as the Judean people were under the Roman empire, they look for someone to free them from oppression. When people understand power to be the kind of power that is coercive, that power over other people, which is the Roman Empire power. They embodied that kind of power entirely. It's natural that folks want their side to take that power instead. But that's not what Jesus was about. 
And those people shouting Hosanna and laying their cloaks and the leafy branches into the street that day, they missed it. And I wonder, I wonder how often as we go through our own lives, we miss it as well. How often we project what we want onto Jesus. How often we misunderstand his teachings, his words, his actions. How often we take what we want and we believe that it's what Jesus wants. And how we react when we're disappointed. Just as those people who shouted Hosanna to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem were disappointed. When we think things are going to go one direction and they wind up going in a different direction, things aren't what we expected they would be, and our disappointment can fuel poor behavior on our part. I'm thinking especially right now about the COVID pandemic and where we go from here. We've spent so much time over the last year thinking about getting back to normal or when this is all behind us. But the thing is, whatever is coming over the next weeks and months, it will not be what we have been imagining. We will not find some kind of cosmic reset button that pulls us back to the way that everything was in the pre-pandemic world. That will never happen. Some things have changed permanently and we're still learning about most of them. And that will be disappointing. And we will continue to be called as we have always been called through this pandemic and before to love our neighbors as ourselves. Love, love being, as we know, an action verb, a thing we make tangible through how we are in the world, not just a feeling that we feel in our hearts. Each and every one of us will find ourselves confronting losses that we thought were only temporary or changes that become permanent or even new challenges that we're still unaware of. We will want things to be different. Of course, we want things to be how we want them to be and they won't be. We will inevitably be disappointed in the, as, as things unwind in reality in the upcoming weeks and months. And disappointment can turn us into people we don't want to be if we aren't careful. Remember what happened when the people discovered that Jesus was not going to overthrow the Roman Empire. Remember how they turned on him, how within just a few days, they went from shouting Hosanna to shouting crucify him. They thought he was gonna fulfill their dreams and give them what they wanted. And then when things didn't go their way, they shouted for his death. This shows us something that is a hard truth. We are also capable of that kind of rapid shift. We're not as different from the people who shouted Hosanna and then crucify him as we might want to think. When things are going our way, when our side, whatever our side is, looks like it's winning, we're enthusiastic, we celebrate, it's great. But when things turn out to be different, we can be very quick to blame, 
quick to criticize, quick to withdraw support, even to condemn. That's where disappointment can lead. So this morning, I find myself wondering, where are we setting ourselves up for disappointment in our lives, in our walk with Jesus? In what ways do we welcome Jesus, but for our own reasons and not for his reasons? In what ways do we reject Jesus when following him demands more than we want to give or more than we think we can give? What would we need to do to help ourselves to stay with Jesus, even in that dark place of being rejected and spat upon, that painful place of being mocked and tortured and lifted on the cross to die. Jesus loves us. Jesus calls us to travel with him to the cross and to the grave and beyond. The journey is not easy, but we travel together. Let us follow where he leads.